No. I'm going to hold you to an answer on that. What makes America the greatest country in the world? A few moments later. Why is America Not the, greatest the, greatest the greatest country in the world, Professor? That's my answer. You're saying... Yes. You're... That's an outrage! These guys are blasting us in the ass! Yeah, I mean, we pay their salaries, and they turn around and ass-blast us? Come on. What are you talking about? You don't pay taxes, you don't even vote. Who am I supposed to vote for? The Republican who's blasting me in the ass, or the Democrat who's blasting me in the ass? Yeah, politics is all one big ass-blast. I remember when the newsroom was coming out and people were going gaga over the speech. Even if you read the comments in the clips on YouTube, a lot of them echo the same thing. Oh, he's right on the money. Oh, I wish politicians and commentators today would have the guts to say this. Yet I remember this praise back in the day and my spidey sense was going off, even though I wasn't into politics at the time. And now looking at it, it both doesn't hold up today and at the time. And with this being said, I'm a fan of Aaron Sorkin, mostly the films he wrote. A Few Good Men, Social Network, Moneyball, Steve Jobs, Molly's Game. He's a skilled screenwriter who has a great voice and an ear for writing dialogue, but I think his political biases hold him back here. Now that being said, he does make some good points here and there. Here are a few examples. We lead the world in only three categories. Number of incarcerated citizens per capita and defense spending, where we spend more than the next 26 countries combined, 25 of whom are allies. We aspired to intelligence. We didn't belittle it. It didn't make us feel inferior. We didn't identify ourselves by who we voted for in the last election, and we didn't, we didn't scare so easy. Those parts are well said, but to me, I believe it's greatly outweighed by the rest of the speech. So let's go through it so you know exactly what I mean. You know why people don't like liberals? Because they lose. If liberals are so smart, how come they lose so I'm always. Hey. This shows his hand and his biases right off the bat for three reasons. First, it's just not true. As far as the presidency, it goes back and forth like a pendulum. Bush Sr. to Clinton to Bush Jr. to Obama to Trump to Biden. People get tired of one side and they go to the other one. And the cycle repeats endlessly. And with the lower levels of government, it goes in waves and cycles. We'll have a red wave, then a blue wave. Or there are places that just vote Democrat or Republican. But saying that liberals always lose is just plain false. Two, he thinks people don't like liberals because they lose. Wow, that's the reason? Gee, let's ask conservatives why they don't like liberals. You think that's the answer they'll give? They lose too much? I'm sure they hate liberals for losing and not how they address crime, or immigration, or identity politics, or healthcare, or gun rights. But even if you ask liberals, there are the hardcores and the moderates. The hardcores will say the reason is liberals don't go far enough, and the moderates not moderate enough. 3. What a criticism. What a burn. You lose too much. It's like one of those job interview questions they ask like, what's your weaknesses? And you say, oh, I work too hard, or I care too much, or I'm a perfectionist. That's some weak sauce criticism and shows you can't critique your own side. And with a straight face, you're going to tell students that America is so star-spangled awesome that we're the only ones in the world who have freedom? Canada has freedom. Canadians have stepped up to do the right thing to protect the freedoms and the rights of Canadians to get back to the things we love to do. We know the way through this pandemic is by getting everyone vaccinated. The small fringe minority of people who are on their way to Ottawa or who are uh, holding unacceptable uh, views uh, that they're expressing do not represent the views of Canadians who have been there for each other, who know that following the science and stepping up to protect each other is the best way to continue to ensure our freedoms, our rights, our values as a country. A few moments later. The federal government has invoked the Emergencies Act. These tools include strengthening their ability to impose fines or imprisonment. A few moments later. We're introducing legislation to implement a national freeze on handgun ownership. What this means is that it will no longer be possible to buy, sell, transfer, or import handguns anywhere in Canada. In other words, we're capping the market for handguns. Japan has freedom. The UK, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Australia, Belgium has freedom. So 207 sovereign states in the world, like 180 of them have freedom. Again, this didn't age well when you think about the last couple of years. Ask these countries exactly how free they were during the pandemic. 
But even back then, saying all these countries have freedom and equating that all these countries have the same level of freedom. I wonder if you ask people from Canada or UK or Australia or France if they would like to have the same freedoms that America has. Even if it was just the First and Second Amendment, I bet they would scream hell yes before you finish the question. Right. And yeah, you, uh, sorority girl, just in case you accidentally wander into a voting booth one day, there's some things you should know. And one of them is, there is absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. Wow, really? No evidence? Not at all? Nothing? Nada? Zip? Zilch? So all those people of the world who want to come here, who pack up their families or even sometimes leave their families, trek across the globe, give up everything, possibly get arrested and die, but yet no evidence. It really illustrates why in his last dumb statement, he conflated all those countries on having the same amount of freedom. So that's why he can say his ridiculous statement here. If the conservative guy to his right would have just butted in over him and said, what about the First and Second Amendment? It would have derailed him entirely. But this is Sorkin's fantasy, so we have to forget about little things like freedom of speech and the right to bear arms. We lead the world in only three categories. Number of adults who believe angels are real. Of course he takes a shot at Christians. It's the easiest shot to take. I had my angry atheist face too, and now I'm just a mellow atheist. I don't pretend to know what happens to me after I die. But that being said, I would rather sit next to an evangelical Christian than a leftist any day. They're going to be far less preachy and won't try to cancel me. If I say the wrong thing, that seems to change on a whim of what the majority of crazy leftists think is offensive. None of this is the fault of a 20-year-old college student, but you nonetheless are, without a doubt, a member of the worst period, generation, period, ever, period. So when you ask what makes us the greatest country in the world, I don't know what the f*** you're talking about. So he says this is none of our fault, then says, you're part of the worst generation in history. Let's unpack that. So at one point, America was the greatest country in the world. Then going by his own logic, it has been ruined to the point where there's literally no evidence that America is that way anymore. I'm confused. So her generation, which is just now going to college, ruined it all? That's pretty damn fast to drag America down that far. It seems like it would take a couple generations. Like maybe yours as well. You know the generation that birthed and nurtured that generation? Otherwise, why would it be bad all of a sudden? They had to learn it from somewhere. Sure used to be. We stood up for what was right. We fought for moral reasons. We passed laws, struck down laws for moral reasons. Then he goes on a schmaltzy speech about how the past was so great. Of course, if you ignore all the bad parts. To me, the only difference between America at its best and now is the size of government. We sacrificed. We cared about our neighbors. We put our money where our mouths were, and we never beat our chest. We built great big things made ungodly technological advances, explored the universe, cured diseases, and we cultivated the world's greatest artists and the world's greatest economy. I wonder what his reasons would be for how we did that. Would it be because of the giant government we have now? You know the one with the largest defense spending that spends as much as the next 26 countries combined? Or was it because of a relatively small one we had in the past? We reached for the stars acted like men. Wow, you couldn't say that today. Which, what does that say about your side, Sorkin? That even in a speech that is supposed to be spicy and tell it like it is, you can't even say act like a man. <laughs> we were able to be all these things and do all these things because we were informed. Notice that most of the examples of why America is so great isn't very tangible or clear. It's a lot of slogans and corny platitudes. Not much in the nuts and bolts of what actually made America great. He sounds like a politician that's good in a commercial. But when you actually ask him about his policies, he's got nothing. And then there's Sorkin's big ace in the hole of why America was so star-spangled awesome. We were informed. This seems a bit self-serving coming from both the character and Sorkin. If we just listened to him and his character, this country would be the greatest country in the world. I know people love to wax poetic about in the good old days the news was honest and free of bias. And today there is nothing but grifters and echo chambers. But I hate to break it to you, but the news has always been biased. The difference is we only had a couple choices back then. A couple of stations, and yes, we had more newspapers, but who were they owned by? People love to bash the internet. But now we actually have real and significantly different choices of the news we want to hear. Is it flawed? Yes. No doubt. But it's still the best vehicle for free expression we've had in history. By great men. Men who were revered. First step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one. America is not the greatest country in the world anymore. 
and yet you haven't really recognized the actual problems. You've described symptoms of why you think America isn't the greatest country in the world, but you haven't addressed the main root problem. What is the problem? And then he kept talking about the Federal Reserve. And I, I was like, that can't be right, because I would have heard of it. <laughs> like, are you telling me there's a shadowy cabal of unaccountable figures who just have complete control of our currency that operate with all of the power of government, yet are privately owned and are making profits, and they're owned by, you know who they're owned by? No, you don't. We don't either. No, they don't know. And, and he was talking about this, and I go, that can't be real. I'm going to look into this to find out why this guy's wrong. And I looked into it. And it turns out he was not wrong. Uh, essentially, here's why, right? Here's why we oppose the Fed first and foremost. Because every evil thing that government does, it could not do without the Federal Reserve. This is the great facilitator of all of the evil things that governments do. And you can start easily with the warfare state. In your lifetime, our military is responsible for the deaths of millions of innocent people. There's a million dead in Iraq, the, the, in, in Afghanistan, a couple hundred thousand at least. Uh, in, in the war in Syria, which was started by the CIA and, and Operation Timber Sycamore, 500,000 dead. And, and let me tell you, in Yemen, when it's all said and done, there's, it's going to be in the millions. And of course, we're backing the Saudis in that war there. That's not to mention throwing Somalia and Pakistan and Libya and all the rest of it. We are in the numbers in the millions, okay? Now, how is this done? How is this funded? We spend about a trillion dollars a year to maintain the U.S. empire, but we don't pay for it in taxes. The Fed prints the money. Can you imagine if, they had to, if, if politicians had to go back to the American people and, and say, we're going to increase your taxes over the last 20 years for the war in Afghanistan? I can guarantee you that baby wouldn't have lasted for 20 years. It would have been over a lot quicker. The reason it persists for so long is because the Federal Reserve is printing the money out of thin air or electrically creating the money out of thin air. Now, of course, you could say that the lockdowns were technically imposed by governors um, by, through emergency you know, declarations. Uh, but what did they do as soon as they imposed those lockdowns? Well, they turned to the federal government and begged for money. They said, we, Donald Trump, you got to send us more stuff. We need ventilators or whatever dumb thing they thought they needed at the time. And then turned out they didn't need any of it. And how did they get that money? The Federal Reserve. We didn't raise taxes in 2020. The Federal Reserve printed almost $4 trillion in a year. People are feeling inflation. It is destroying people's lives. People have this goofy view that somehow economic issues are over here and social issues are over here, but that's just not true. Liberty is one issue. It is one whole concept, as the great Ron Paul always taught us. There's no economic liberty or social liberty. It's all individual liberty. It's all one package. If you're going to tell me that inflation is not a social issue, tell that to the guy who's making 60 grand a year and has three kids and now all of a sudden can't afford to provide for his family anymore. Does that, that seem, that's probably a little bit of a social issue for that guy. Inflation as the Austrian economists understood, is not about rising prices. Rising prices are the result of inflation. Inflation is the expansion in the money supply. That's what led to all of this. It's all the Federal Reserve's fault. And this is what we need to channel that energy that people have, that outrage. are blasting us in the ass. Yeah, I mean, we pay their salaries, and they turn around and ass blast us? Come on. What are you talking about? You don't pay taxes. You don't even vote. Who am I supposed to vote for? The Republican who's blasting me in the ass or the Democrat who's blasting me in the ass? Yeah, politics is all one big ass blast.